everyone, this is Elad from Astrolab Diagnostics and today I would like to talk about clustering algorithm choices. And in my mind, there's two main choices you need to make. One, which clustering algorithm to use with your data. And two, how to parameterize it. In other words, how many clusters do you need to look for? And just as a quick reminder, in previous videos I talked about this idea of an analysis pipeline where you start with the raw data and you go through a series of steps to get into insights, into ideas that can promote your research. And then I discussed the idea of a uh, taxonomy of clustering algorithms where you consider the underlying math, the critical parameter, and the technical aspect of running the algorithm. And now I would like to, to tackle the question, which algorithm should you use? Now, I will preface by saying that there are a lot of opinions out there. With a capital O, I'm providing just one more opinion. So make sure to ask around, discuss this with other people, because I think the, uh, the perspectives vary quite a bit. So here's my take on this. Um, there has been an excellent benchmark paper from Weber and Robinson that was released in Cytometry A in 2016. They've taken 18 different clustering methods and applied them to six publicly available datasets. What I'm showing you here are the results for two of these datasets. And in each one of these figures, the x-axis um, is the F1 score. This is a score of, uh, of accuracy where you have some ground truth and you compare your clustering to that ground truth. In this case, the ground truth that Weber and Robinson used is some traditional manual gating. The y-axis is the runtime in seconds. And to the left, you're seeing a database called Levine 32 Dimension. This was taken from the phenograph paper from Levine et al. And this data set um, is classic immune profiling, many different immune subsets, a broad view of the, uh, of the immune system. To the right, you see Mosman Rare. And in this data set, um, we are looking for a specific rare subset. And we want to see whether the clustering algorithm identified that subset correctly. So, Starting with uh, the left figure, looking at Levine, you can see that there is a pretty broad uh, uh, range of success across the different algorithms. However, two of these algorithms, um, one of these algorithms, Flowsum, seems to be to the top right, uh, to the bottom right, which means that it has the highest accuracy and it runs really, really fast. Remember, the y-axis is seconds, so Flowsum runs in just a few minutes. So at least for this data set, Flowsum seems to be the winner. Then to the right, looking for rare cell subsets, um, the winner seems to be XShift. Um, now, what I would like to point out that is that XShift actually performs pretty well for the Levine immune profiling data set, and that Flowsum has reasonable results for the Mosman data set. And in fact, if you read the um, the uh, conclusions from the paper, they seem to list Flowsum and XShift as one of the better options. So in my mind, if you are thinking about which algorithm you want to run, I would say that these two are probably a good starting point. Um, Flowsum is super accessible. You can run it with Flowjo, you can run it with R, uh, you can run it in Cytobank, and I think that it has quickly become this the method of choice. Um, another popular option, which is not highlighted here, is Phenograph. Um, Phenograph is a solid algorithm. Full disclosure, I'm one of the authors on the Phenograph paper. And um, you can easily run it from Site of Kit and from Flojo as well. So with regards to which clustering algorithm to use, I would say start with Flowsum, maybe XShift, maybe Phenograph, and really try to not overthink it. I think that Flowsum is, is pretty, it's a pretty solid option right now. I will point to one algorithm that you probably shouldn't use, um, and that algorithm is Spade. And Spade was very popular in the early days of the Cytoff, and uh, you can run it through Cytobank. It's a solid algorithm. Um, however, I think it's been outshined by some of the more modern options. If you've already analyzed your data with Spade, no worries, keep using it. However, moving forward, I strongly suggest you move to one of the other algorithms. Then the next question is, how many clusters should you use? And once again, there are many opinions out there. And um, you might talk to a bioinformatician and he will tell you, well, you can use this score to assess the number of clusters. Um, and that might create the idea that there's a solution out there to the cluster count problem. However, 
this is not entirely accurate. There's actually many different scores you can use to assess whether the number of clusters you have is correct or not. And just picking this score is a problem into itself. So unfortunately, there isn't really any science or math that can tell you if the number of clusters you have is the correct one. Um, one thing you can do is you can use qualitative metrics. For example, do you see the major populations that you expect? When you look at biaxial plots of different clusters, do they seem relatively uh, pure? Going to another paper, this one comes from uh, single cell RNA sequencing. They assessed different clustering algorithms here on the x-axis. And I won't elaborate on the figure itself. I suggest you check out the paper for the details. Briefly, the clustering algorithms are ordered from left to right based on the clustering accuracy, where left is the worst. And you might notice that flowsum is to the far left in this figure. These figures differ by the number of clusters that the operator used. Um, for the left figure, the operator used the expected number of subsets. In this case, I think it was 10 or 15. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember. In other words, you're asking the clustering algorithm to find exactly the n number of subsets you expect. To the right, the uh, operator chose a k which overclustered the data, which was higher than the um, higher than the um, um, the expected number of subsets, and you see that Flowsum's performance improved quite dramatically. Um, in fact, uh, it is comparable to the other top methods. So I would say that when dealing with site of data, if you're thinking about how many clusters you use, the safe choice is probably to overcluster. Whether that number is 20 or 50 or 80 really depends on the data set. But when you do decide on the number of clusters, maybe start with a handful of samples, three, four, five samples, overcluster them, let's say 80 clusters, and then see if you need to go up and down, again, based on qualitative means. So in summary, there's a lot of algorithms out there. I would strongly recommend Flowsum. Um, it seems to be working well. There's two other options that I mentioned, uh, and you can look into these as well. With regards to the number of clusters, try to overcluster. So thank you so much for listening. Please make sure to subscribe to this channel. You can also find us on LinkedIn and Twitter. I will provide the uh, links in the description. And reach out if you have any questions. Thank you for your time and have a good day.